Well, are you excited this morning? Amen. Before I introduce Dick uh, and Donna this morning, anything, we're like double recording this morning, so we've got two machines going. And if there's a, uh, a word that you would get in song or word from Dick this morning, everything's recorded. In fact, Heather's putting the, the, your name and the number that will be on the track. So we're trying to make this as easy as, as we can. So um, I'm excited about Dick and Donna being with us. Once a year they come and they bless our church and uh, we always look forward to it. And so I, I hope after the service especially that you'll come up and give them both a big hug and just love on them. Yes, honey. Hmm? You will get your word today. Is that possible? Or are we going to have to duplicate it in the next week? Okay. Because we have to run the duplicator and and it makes four or five at a time, but it just will take some time to label it and stuff. But uh, Dick Williams, Dick and Donna, what a wonderful family they have. They have two sons and I don't know how many grandchildren. How many? Just one? Lord, multiply. <laughs> but Dick Williams is a, a blessing to the body of Christ for many, many, many years. He has been traveling from coffee houses to churches to conferences to just wherever the Lord opens the door to him. Um, he goes and just encourages and strengthens. And uh, you're going to love the music. Uh, you're going to love even how God uses him in the prophetic to encourage his church and to encourage individuals. So uh, let's give a big welcome to Dick and Donna Williams. All the way from Boise, Idaho. Thank you. Always delighted to get to swing by your wedding. I love Eugene Peterson's rendering of Matthew 11, 28, 29, where Jesus is inviting folks to come from the boxes of secularism and legalism to join him in his yoke and shed the burdens imposed upon them by the world of flesh and the devil. And as Eugene puts it, to find the unforced rhythms of his grace. I love that. Reading that a while back and it inspired this song. Traveling light, I've rolled my burdens just like boulders. Upon the one who cares for me, his mighty shoulders make them feathers as we run together. Traveling lights, free to run this race with Jesus. The world's cold wind upon my face can't match his grace. His mighty breath my soul resuscitates. The devil's roadblocks I'm seeing down the pike. No match for the master, no fear. Sometimes he hits him like a Mack truck on the loose. Sometimes we just glide over like a pair of leaping deer. Traveling light, don't know how long will be my journey. He's always on both day and night, my inner light. I'm leaning on his might and traveling light. Leaning on his might and traveling light. Men are searching to find the answers to the questions that never cease. They find in life there's something missing. They're looking for release and the way to peace. He is the way. Without him, there's no going. He is the truth. Without him, there's no knowing. He is the life now and eternally. He satisfies the searching heart and fills man 
with his love so rich and free. Blaise Pascal, the great French scientist, said, Man is born with a God-shaped vacuum that can only be filled through a relationship with God facilitated through King Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. And you know, when we are born naturally in this world, spiritually we're stillborn. The light that was by divine design to be the habitation of the king went out with Adam's sin. So as we proceed on forward in our natural growth, it's a deep, dark hole in the inner space of our core that cries out across the chasms of eternity to the God we were made for but have yet to know, sometime feeling like we're in the holding pattern, the slammer of eternity's death row, which in a sense we are until our encounter with him. And in our depths, we are made to enjoy and experience by divine design, intimacy based on love, identity, a knowing of who we are as sons and daughters, authority, the ability to be empowered to dominate the adversity that surrounds us, and with destiny, a sense of a hope and a future moving forward now ongoingly, unfold, unfoldingly, and even into the timelessness of eternity. We're made for God, who alone can supply intimacy, identity, authority, and destiny. Poor substitutes otherwise. And it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whereby man insists on being his self-sourced independent contractor and they might in the world's eyes succeed to varying degrees but lose it as far as eternity goes and they will somehow seek to manufacture these things and to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life it's to simply reaffirm Adam's act and the contagion of it and attempt to be our own king, our own judge, and our own deliverer. And by God's grace, as we cry out to him, we wake up to the fact that the job of king, judge, and deliverer has already been taken. None others need apply. And as the king himself enters as our life source with all of his buoyancy, force, and flow, the life of Jesus invades our spirit when we receive him, he becomes our example, but also our enabler. He becomes the one who demands life from us, but is the dynamic that supplies life from it. And we learn from the fathomless depths of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit within us, that Jesus permeates that with his presence. And when we first come to the Lord, our heart, that's our depths of how we truly perceive, believe, and are impassioned, is compatible with our spirit. We have a new spirit and a new heart. However, whereas our spirit is fully formed in that perfect son created in righteousness, holiness of the truth that cries, Abba, Father, and is perpetually positioned in judicial blamelessness ongoingly from then on, the heart is capable of wondering. And it can get into our soul region and get religious on us and condemn us. But be of good cheer. God's greater than your heart. Our heart can camp around our anatomy and become narcissistic in all manner of ways. But when our spirit is regularly fed, that it is infused with the substance of God's word, inhales the breath of the scriptures and is flexed to worship and praise him in spirit and in truth which by divine design it is and it very often begins folks 
with an awakening to the fact that our spirit is the supreme essence of who we are. And very often, irrespective of how we feel, it's very important to let our mouths engage with the master gear of the God that has ordained it and say, Lord, I may not feel like it momentarily. I may feel as anointed as a moldy fig. I may be struggling with a knockdown area in my life, but I want to approach you for resolve and my license, my qualification to approach you is your gift of righteousness. And I declare that in my spirit, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am a new creature created in righteousness and holiness of the truth, Lord. And I have intimacy with you. I am one with you, not same as you, but one with you in intimacy. I have access and audience with you at any time, Lord. I have identity as a son, esteemed to sit at your right hand through the perfect performance of the perfect one, Jesus Christ, the patterned son, Amen. with whom I'm a joint heir. And Lord, I thank you so much for the dominion in his name to be able to fire missiles from this vantage point to satanic death stars, to be equipped with the king's keys of the kingdom and infantry mop up and go down and be unlocking hell cells and some of them I need to get out of in course of letting others out of. Right. It's to the pulling down of strongholds both within and without. And furthermore, Lord, I am assigned a hope and a future. I have a destiny in you. I am yeah. by divine design given a particular soul chemistry like nobody else's. My particular combination of giftings and just the expression, though they may be similar to others, are absolutely a unique fingerprint of your yeah, expression. Right. And Father, you've got a plan whereby you give me an opportunity to be enjoyed by you to where I can feel like your favorite and to thoroughly enjoy you and begin to recognize those capacities you've given me to have those edges honed and sharpened to serve and fulfill my mission, hope, and future on this side, even as I'm being trained to reign in the endless reaches of glory. That's who we are in our spirit. And then our heart is awakened to where our treasure is. And what did Jesus say? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The heart is our depths of how we perceive God. We perceive him as our loving father who is love personified, who is purely love motivated, who is generous and extravagant in his love, sacrificially merciful beyond calculation. That's who he is. And who we are because of him are lavishly favored and extravagantly loved. Praise the name of the Lord. And we recognize that we have a passion for him. That he is our highest and best because he made us for himself. Our heart has been awakened as it were and becomes the receiving reservoir of the Holy Spirit from our spirit. And whereas Paul said, go and be strengthened by the power of his might in your inner man, that's your spirit, it's joined by our heart. And Jesus, who permeates our spirit, now becomes not just resident, but central in our heart. And all other things begin to come into order around him. Even our struggles begin to be into order. And not only do these things surround him in his order, he is in each of those things. If we're in an area of our life, and we can't find Jesus there. It's a good idea to join our foot with his and kick that out. Right. <clears throat> right. Praise the name of the Lord. We've been renewed to the continuity of our spirit is underscored. And with the eagle soars in our heart joined by our spirit and moves in harmonious sync and becomes the reservoir of his life that pours into our soul. Our soul at the time of regeneration for most of us looked like a combination of a soap opera and a train wreck. But the Lord began to masterfully mold and be invasive and restorative and pervasive. And his desire is that it not stay like that. As through John's epistle, I would above all that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. 
That's the unique chemistry of our self-awareness of who we feel we are in the present tense and what goes out from us. It's not a self-centeredness, but it's a self-awareness that we are loved and favored and can pass that on to others. Praise the name of the Lord. Having those cravings deep within men, those cravings of oneness, of intimacy, of identity, of knowing who we are, authority to take dominion over the adversity that would surround in a troubled fallen world, and a destiny, a hope, and a future, a sense of mission for and with his majesty. Praise the name of the Lord. It's important to get that refueling on a regular basis. We're from Idaho, but I wrote this song in Montana. Another brisk Montana morning, golden glimmer has me blinking. Rising now, I hear me creaking. Down the hall I toil to the place I meet with Jesus. Feed the empty stove and I'm load. Soon the room is bright with warm glow. Coffee pot is dancing to a boil. Divine appointment. His name is just like ointment. Well, he rubs it into my needy soul. I'm worshiping my God. On my fire, the master's breathing, consuming all my fear and grieving. Inner fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Out my window there I gaze, scan the morning's golden haze. Two deer bolt across the yard, the Lord renews my youth. My spirit leaps and runs with Jesus through the meadows of his kingdom. Brightness of his fragrant freedom, grazing on the greatness of his truth. Divine appointment, his name is just like ointment. Rubs it into my needy soul, I'm a-worshipping my God. On my fire the master's breathing, consuming all my fear and grieving. Inner fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Now our heart is in position to receive revelation. Paul goes on to say that you would receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation having our hearts open, the eyes of our hearts open to who God is. It's not just finitely caged in our gray matter. I know our boomer generation, we've been very cerebral. We've had to get weaned from that. We took certain messages from the Bible and made them the center instead of the spoke and had it all figured out in our head and spewed it out our mouths and it turned to straw in our mouths. And we said, well, this stuff doesn't work. And then said, forget it, I'm just going to survive the best way I can through my own righteousness, and that's pretty shabby. But the Lord has been doing a marvelous awakening transgenerationally in boomers, and we are seeing that he is a heart God, that we seek him with our heart. Seeking is desire plus diligence with expectancy, and he begins to, from our spirit, by his spirit, give us revelation knowledge of who he is. We see who he is in his generosity, power, might, and mercy. And we add to revelation, we add declaration from our hearts. And he pounces on that with power. He leads us into the fulfillment of the manifestation of all he's provided through the finished work. And we learn there's patience worked in us in the meanwhile. But we are learning that he's a heart God. He sees the bruise, disappointment, discouragement of hope deferred and heart sickness and so many. And he comes as we seek him. And he says, I'm showing you what I'm really, really like. In all my patriarchal tenderness and prizing of you, thus stated through the priceless blood of my son. And I'm going to give you ongoing extended revelation, the Lord does say, of Jesus. It's like a portrait without a frame in all of his glory. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to show you increasingly who he is to the eyes of your heart and what he has and what he has made yours. He says it well in uh, John 16, 13. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will glorify me, framed in glory, this portraiture of our all in all 
And he goes on to say that the Holy Spirit will take of mine and make it yours. He will announce it by way of revelation. The word there is an announcement that says, come and receive. But then he says, having received the revelation, the Spirit will lead us into the truth of the experience, the expression, and enjoyment of it there. So we are coming and we're seeing the grandeur of Jesus, our all in all, who says, my father is like I am. We're seeing the inheritance with which we're joint heirs of intimacy, identity, authority, and destiny. And the Holy Spirit says, come, and I'm going to announce and disclose and reveal that to you. It's going to become a motivating revelation and a desire to experience and possess and portray and share and he says, I'm going to lead you into that truth, make you increasingly one with it, and cause you to be liberated by it, even as you're a liberator. Amen. I can remember the first time I began to see the intimacy with the Lord. I was a new Christian at UCLA at the time, and I was working uh, about 30 hours a week and holding down a fairly full load, and just was just dwindling down to nothing just the raw burnout of it. And I can remember of just falling into bed at night in my room near the campus and being reduced to just all I could hear my spirit was saying, Abba, Father, but there was something so soothing about it. He was saying, you're mine, you're one with me, you have intimacy, you have access and audience with me at any time, and he began to train me in that regard. I remember a having teachings on sonship through Dave Hanna, who lately beca later became uh, uh, the head of Athletes in Action. And Dave would expound on what it was to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus through the adoption of sonship, just that place of restful authority and perspective. And it's like I could sense myself just being catapulted and projected into that situation as he was teaching and that revelation began to grow and grow and grow over the years, even at times that I'd felt I'd just crashed and burned and made the unpardonable foul up. The Lord was there to remind me of my intimacy access with him through my inheritance with Jesus and the fact that I was a son seated at his right hand. And then went on to begin to learn the authority of the believer, that we would have dominion really interesting. This was back in the days of um, Action Life Ministries there in Canoga Park, California. And it was just a little bit before I met Donna. But we were a wild kind of group. We didn't have any mothers and fathers in the spirit among us. So we were like rocks in a bag getting shook up and we sur survived one another and blessed one another in, in the course of it. Had to forgive one another a bunch. Uh, and interesting time in our lives, but I can remember when I was crying out to God, what about the authority of the believer? And somebody, I don't even remember who it was, it was a book they uh, had finished or didn't especially want. It was just a little, about 30, 40 page book by Kenneth Hagin on the authority of the believer. And it was on particular dealing with demonic elements that had made intrusions and become rooted, not in the spirit, but in the thinking and emotions of people through trauma, repeated sinning, that crush of disappointment, and just those things that can make that vulnerable. And um, he, uh, Kenneth Hagin he articulated it in his style very simply and very relevantly. And on that same day, I got a letter in my mailbox from a young man who was going through harboring in himself all manner of sexual perversities and just describing the anguish of what it felt like and the cry to be set free and i knew you know we were talking demonic here and i began to uh, to pray for him and he put a pseudo name there he didn't want to put his regular name and it was at a meeting uh, in dave and jan malkin's house it was two uh, days later he sidled over to me in the midst of a crowd, and there must have been 70 people jammed in that home that was not bodaciously large. And he said, I'm so-and-so, the one that signed the letter. And of course, I had 
known who he was in the natural, but had not known of the problem. <laughs> now I said, Jerry, let's head back to that side room over there that we used for personal prayer. And I just went by the book. I said, Jesus, I come in your authority, not my own. This young man is your possession. He is blood bought, blood, uh, blood bought. And this is a trespasser who has become rooted and built a stronghold of bricks of a house of lies. And it is inhabiting it and is defining him and driving him in a perverse identity that is not his by his legal right. And Lord, I just come against it in the authority of Jesus. And he was really ripe for deliverance. And I says, I just expel this thing in Jesus' name and command it to leave. And it was basically just the way I had heard Kenneth Hagin say it. And I had taken it and made it my own, translated it into my heart. And it was like this young man, he just kind of drew together bodily and then and, and did this wonderful, peaceful, relaxed sound. And a smile came over his face. And what a delight three days later when he called me and says, Hey, Brother Dick, I am starting to recognize beautiful young women, whereas before that had not been the case. This, hallelujah, authority, authority to deal with the adversity that would attack us and with others. And it's a difficult and it's a fallen world, but in the midst of it, the Lord begins to refine and develop our sense of destiny that we have a unique role, a piece of the action in seeing his glory manifest to the zenith, even in these end times, in these last days. It takes end time Christians for an end time church, but the Lord calls us individually to press into him, underscore our spirit, inhale the breath of the word, confess and declare who we are in Christ, irrespective of how we're feeling, have our heart beckoned, and wooed to be where our treasure is, to be filled with a reservoir of the Spirit, and streams would go into our soul in the process of making us whole, and would go out through the avenues of our attitude, action, our gaze, and gestures, as out of our innermost being would flow rivers of living water, yet the debris of our imperfections also, but that just lets people know we're human. We're a work in progress. Praise the name of the Lord. A few personal words now. And as I've told you before, anything with prophetic implication has got to be tested, laid alongside the written rod of God, the scriptures, borne witness to by the Spirit as you hear it, and I submit it to pastoral authority here. And anything I say publicly to you wouldn't be to shame or underscore things that would provide embarrassment in any way but would speak to something of the deposit of the Lord in you, of your need of the Lord in a, maybe a healing touch and embrace, the underscoring of a particular passion, a stoking of a fire in a certain gift area, edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's 1 Corinthians 14 and 3. And think it not absurd that a prophetic word might be sung What is your name, my brother? Jonathan. What again? Jonathan. Jonathan. Now, Jonathan, the Lord takes great delight in calling you son. I can almost see the buttons busting off his robe as he looks at you and calls you son because he knows you went through some things that were far from fun. But he was there. When the road seemed non-negotiable and it looked like a cliff at the end of it. And even when it seemed to be, he was there with a safety net. And the sword of the Spirit hit those hackles on your heels and the next thing you know, you begin to run. And you're taking great delight in the freedom that you have. And a man of compassion who spreads it on the wounds of others is sad. God bless you, Jonathan. Papa's delighted with you. What is your name right here? Amy, you know, when you sing, the Lord 
permeates the praises of his people. That's Psalm 22, 1. And yet there's an added dimension. It's got a way to where your song inhabited with his presence raises you up into eagle flight. And you often get the aerial view. And when you land, you've got some things to say that you saw from up there. So it's a praiser, one who raises her voice, and the Lord permeates the praise to lift you on high to rejoice. And you see life from eagle flight. And it's a marvelous perspective. And the giants of the arena down below shrink in size. And you're able to speak to others and cause them to realize they have the victory. You're an enjoyer and an importer of the aerial view. Reminds me of a song I wrote, the chorus went. I catch the upward winds that you send to lift me high. My troubles seem like specks as there upon the ground they lie. I look into your eyes so true as you take my soul and you make it new. The upward wind has lifted me to you. Seated right behind Amy is Chad? Ken. Okay, Ken. Get it. Ken, highly contemplative. A thinker. But not somebody who gets tripped up in his own gray matter. There is a cart cry for wisdom. Say, Lord, I want to know your mind in matters and an ability to articulate it. And he's given you an ability as a communicator. There'll be a mix of profundity and droll in it. Good sense of humor, a way to package things creatively. And yet state them in a matter-of-fact kind of congeniality. A contemplator who often seeks the Lord with your heart. And no, you don't lay your brains on the shelf, but you get your mind renewed. And you come up with revelation and the ability to bring it up in conversation and give it articulation as you have the heart of an instructor. What is your name? Aaron? Aaron, a fiery exhorter. And the Lord has relit your fire, a live coal on your lips, as with Isaiah, a pressing into his presence and seeing him high and lifted up as his train. That is the robe that symbolizes his conquest. Each time a king conquered a king, he added a part of a robe onto it to where he who has conquered all manner of whatever that's dark, dead, and mean. You're getting a vision of just how powerful he is and a live coal on your lips to declare with fiery exhortation a fire that will liberate from chains and melt religious ice. Hallelujah. He's the dominant one, the name above all names, Jesus. Through the finished work of his cross, he has canceled sin's power and through his resurrection has facilitated a dimension where moment by moment we can live apart from sin's power. You might crash and burn on occasion, have to get airborne again, and say, Lord, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I crashed into a tree trying to be a Jesus impersonator instead of allowing him to be the replicator of himself in me and following as he followed the Holy Spirit and 
that revelator of that perfect, sinless, pure, innocent life becomes my elevator as I cast myself in reckless abandon upon him and am renewed to risenness. Risen over the penalty of sin, enjoying the full assurance of my salvation that's mine. A lot of people that have it that don't enjoy the assurance of it. And Lord, of the moment-by-moment moment availability of, over sin's power, Father, the ability to recognize that I am lifted above the gravity of the instigators of sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and I have authority over the effects of sin, depression, disease, and poverty. That's the dominion we have. And we grow up into it. We get the revelation and the Spirit begins to lead us into it, through it. Sometimes some knock down, drag out situations. Hey, but we come through and we prevail. Praise the name of the Lord. We're more than conquerors because he supplied it and we're being schooled to walk in it. The one who positioned us in perfect righteousness by his death we're called now for the reading of the will and testament and who should be there but the one who's risen who is saying, I'm going to mentor you through the Holy Spirit to walk in what I have provided as a joint heir. He says, you won't get the, jo the whole enchilada on this side of glory, but you can get a massive chunk of it. Just don't be satisfied to scratch laughing plaster. Right. Hallelujah. So he begins to lead us and who we are and what we have is daily we give ourselves over to the overcomer and we may have drifted out into legalism and lawlessness for a season of years but he knows where we are and is able to retrieve us and bring us back to that pathway and put us on course with our destiny I know many people of boomer age that had vision of the mission and call of God upon their lives and try to make it happen by sheer force of gray matter and sheer force of muscle and with a, a raw boomer work ethic and found themselves just running around in circles, shooting themselves in the leg of their own wilderness. And God is coming and showing them grace, not so much as a doctrine, but as a dynamic, the operational power of God's ability to do in us, for us, through us, what we could never do in and of ourselves and as we give ourselves over to him by faith, that grace inheritance which our inheritance of all we have in and through Christ, of intimacy, identity, authority, and destiny begins to come into view, and I'm seeing them realize their dream. I'm seeing them start businesses that are becoming lights in the corporate and entrepreneurial community. I'm seeing some of them come into ministry, some of them hearing calls to foreign missions. I've seen some of them uh, just do some wonderful things like uh, get flight training and then flight instruction and then evangelism with their flight students. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's stewardship, you can't abuse it. But I mean, you, you, you got it dead to rights when you're up there like that. I got a good, good friend of mine in Idaho Falls that's led any number of folks to the Lord like that. Praise the name of the Lord. But you know, folks, we're coming into our all. The church is sensing its intimacy in the throne room, our inheritance, our identity of who we are as sons and daughters, lavishly, generously, extravagantly loved. And as those deputized with authority to declare in praise in the enemy's face, to declare before God, to declare with one another in the swapping of just glorious testimony and just anointed self-talk that's good. Learning to come into our authority and tread upon serpents and we're learning to be fashioned with a people with a passion for God to have our peace of the action. We recognize that each of us has an important role, whether it might be some more prolific and public and others behind the scenes. I don't care if I'm the quarterback, I want a jersey. Hallelujah.
Something marvelous is beginning to happen with an ache and a groan in our nation, folks. An interceding church awakened to its role to assert the government of God under the headship of Jesus is beginning to see our nation awaken. And yeah, it's very chaotic and confusing right now in the nation. God's not the author of confusion, but he's the exposer of it. And even as the swamp gets drained, what's under there might be scarier yet, probably will be. But the Lord's doing something. He's building a church to embody and express the kingdom using living stones, people like you and I coming into our inheritance and becoming a temple, a body, a family, an army, and a bride. And he's the builder, and we're his workmanship. Most of the songs I sing are right. This one was by Mr. Johnny Cash earlier on, and it later in Johnny's late career when he became really close to the Lord, became a signature song. Jesus was a carpenter. You know he worked with a saw and a hammer. And his hand could form a table true enough to stand forever. Could have lived his life out in the little town of Nazareth, but he laid aside his tools, walked the burning highways as he built a house with folks like you and me, living stones. And he found them as they wandered in the wild Judean mountains, and he called them as they pulled their nets across the Sea of Galilee. For a thousand evenings as the days behind him ended, he walked among the poor and he stopped to touch the dying as he built a house with folks like you and me. Would it be the same upon the sands of California or on the sweating blacktop of New York or Mississippi where the mighty churches rise up high above the screaming cities? Would he be a guest on Sunday and a vagrant on a Monday? Would men lock their doors against the king today? Oh, but you move again, Lord Jesus, move as a carpenter among us. Men build chapels to their discontent, cathedrals to their sorrow. Many live in golden mansions with the sand for a foundation. And the raging water's rising, God, the raging water's rising, yet you build your house on rock once more today. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God bless America, land that I love, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night, through the night with a light from above, from the mountains, from the mountains to the prairie, to the ocean, white with foam. God bless America. My home, sweet home. Lord, invade the realm of politics. 
give men and women of integrity, of born-again fidelity, Father, the ability to aspire to office in response to your call, Lord. Give them favor with the people. Give them wisdom in office. Evoke repentance, Father, in the halls of Congress. Cause there to be a seeing of your goodness and the rejection of your sovereignty that's ushered in just the hell winds of these times. Lord, heal the vitriol in the flesh versus flesh, spirit of murder and hatred, Lord God. Lord, invade the halls of our institutions of learning, Father. Bring professors and teachers into view with a sense of a godly call on their lives and be invasive in there and raise up cores of students that'll be militant warriors for the king and his kingdom. Invade the glitz and glamour of show business, Father. Cause there to be a seeing of the emptiness in and of itself, but the potential of light, of harnessing media and manifesting majesty, Lord. Lord, often as need be, move us to repentance in its depths, to turn from that which is toxic and turn to that which is living, namely yourself, and be a people of vision that sees your hand of love on our nation, and with that revelation, make it a heated declaration that the legions and minions of hell must bow down in honor. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the ocean white with foam god bless america my home sweet home god bless america my home sweet home and in the words of the prophet isaiah and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it so be it and God bless each of you Thank you, Dick. We're going to pray for them because I know they're on a journey. How many more stops do you have before you head back home? This is it. Okay. Well, good. I know you're anxious to get home, and we're going to pray a blessing to you. Before we pray, let me just uh, just say this. Just thank God for your words and uh, one of the things I've done when he comes and a lot of times I I like to close my eyes when he's speaking because uh, there's such a richness of the Lord's words to us that, that just minister not to your mind but to your heart and I want to encourage you to do this this week I want you to put an order in ask Heather to make a CD for you and if you had got uh, prophetic words uh, it'll be ready for you next next Sunday if you come hopefully or if you can't come we'll have it at the office for you but uh, I'd like for you guys to get what uh, was shared this morning I love the music but I love the words that are spoken because there's just so much encouragement 
such a richness of vocabulary that Dick has, but it is a, <clears throat> a reminder of who you are. It's a reminder of the greatness of God. It's a reminder that keep on going and a reminder that not to settle. Let me hear what I'm saying, not to settle for just existing, but persevering and going on to the high places that we have in Christ Jesus. And I want to encourage you this as we, where we get to pray for them. I want you to value the time you have with the Lord and take that time with the Lord. And that time you read the word and that time you spend in prayer and the time you have with the Holy Spirit is such a valuable thing for you. It's such a valuable thing for you. And so if you're a housewife and you're working a job and you're just busy and there's so many things that are going on, let me tell you, God will honor the time that you give him. God is going to honor the time you give him. And some of the secrets that you see in the Bible of the people that were just disciples of Jesus, a lot of times they got up early. And some of, them, some of you might need to get up early with a coffee cup in hand and a Bible laid out and your time with the Lord. And it might need to be dark. And sometimes it's at lunchtime. And sometimes it's before you go to bed. But the time that you give the Lord, he values it and we value it because he speaks to us and he comforts us and if Dick was encouraging with us, it is revelation that becomes a transformation and a smile that comes from deep within because we have been with him. Amen? Amen. So I, I really want to encourage you. See, Heather, get a hold of today's. I mean, it'll be on the website on uh, Wednesday, but uh, I kind of like the stop and start ability to have it in your car or, or whatever. But get this today. Stretch your hands out toward Dick and Donna. Why don't some of you just get up? Just, just come on over here. Come on. Just gather around here. And I'll give you a chance to hug their neck and say hi to them. Come on. Would you come, church? You guys are great. You're just see, seated right there. Come on, church family. Please, we don't want you to be left out. Can you pick up that guitar so we won't? Well, give it to Nick. He can. You got it? Okay. We want a 12-string guitar. Amen. Are you ready to pray? Come on, people of God. Father, we are so grateful for these two, for their faithfulness, Lord. And Lord, we just speak blessings over them today. We speak blessings over Dick and Donna and their son, and that grandbaby, the work of their hands. And God, we just bless them now. And we pray, Lord, that as they get in the car to go back to Boise, that God, there's going to be safety on the trip safety on the trip and a joy that would just flood that car that this would just be a happy joyful time as they go home knowing that not only are you protecting them god by your heavenly host but god i just that, that smile from heaven that says well done my faithful servants well done my faithful servants and so lord we bless them we pray for their health God, that, that Dick would have a complete recovery from that injury to his back. God, that, it, that the pain would be gone, the stiffness would be gone. We declare the name of Jesus to his back, to his body. And God, you just bring strength and recovery. And we bless Donna also with strength in her body. God, we pray for that. We pray, God, that their spirits would just be on fire. They already are. But God, that the coals that are on the altar would just be set on fire for you. That it would blaze brightly, Lord. That, Lord, as they have poured out so much on this trip, now, Lord, you would just refill them again. That their cup would overflow. And, God, there would just be a, a peace and a joy because of the anointing that lives within. Hallelujah. Flood their homes with peace and joy. And God, we're praying, even as he is planning for next year, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. There would just be those doors open, that you would call Dick and Donna to go and minister and to encourage the saints of God. 
So we bless them. We thank you for them. I pray, God, that you would pr provide for them financially. We say, Lord, pour out the windows of heaven to be opened upon Dick and Donna. Lord, bless them now. Finances, strength, joy, peace, anointing, and direction. In Jesus' name, we thank you for them, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, hug somebody and come and hug them. Bless you.